In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in. Of your name. Well, good morning, friendship. 
He is risen. He is is risen risen indeed. indeed. (laughs) All right. We are so excited to have you here worshiping with us this morning, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to invite you to stand and sing. And please feel free to dance around and, you know, be joyous during this song because our Redeemer lives. And so we're going to sing that this morning. Ready? Pastor Ben has some announcements. Amen, amen. He lives. He's, he's alive. Tomb is empty. And we thank the Father for allowing us to be here. Uh, we, we humbly come into his house unencumbered, no gunshots. We didn't have to duck coming in. You know, what a blessing it is uh, to be in his house today on this special day. You know, we started off, I want to give you a some information, we had over 245 children here yesterday uh, hunting eggs and uh, seeking the Lord. It was, a, it was a blessing we had. Our prayer tent was very active, praying with many of them. Uh, and, you know, if there's 245 children, they probably brought twice as many adults with them in the form of parents or grandparents. So we probably had about 800 people come through yesterday it was very active, very busy, uh, a lot of fellowshipping. It was just such a blessing. Uh, but then we also awoke uh, to the news that the tomb is empty. We started with sunrise service here at Friendship. If you were part of that, there was probably about 80, 85 people there out in the parking lot watching the sunset or sunrise uh, and uh, worshiping him. And it was just such a great time. And then we came in for breakfast. Uh, but you are here now. You are safe. Uh, you are ready to be fed. Uh, we're pretty excited about the message today and the news we have to share. 
Uh, I want to get into the wisdom with you. As I was praying on Friday uh, for direction, uh, I was thinking about the message, and if you've been on this journey with us and, and uh, you've been going down Romans Road with the Holy Spirit, uh, you know that today's message is on hope delayed. So I started thinking about what does that mean, hope delayed, and I was praying on that. And one of the things that first popped into my mind, I believe the Holy Spirit gave me, was the Samaritan woman at the well. I was thinking about that encounter and how she was longing for and hoping for the Messiah. She said, you know, uh, she was an outcast, basically. She was wondering why he was at Jacob's well. But if you think about, and if you know the story uh, of why he went to Samaria, why he went on that mission trip, uh, the Jews and the Samarians did not get along. In fact, they hated each other. There was a lot of hatred between the two. It's kind of interesting what is going on in Israel right now. Uh, but Jesus took his apostles and went to Samaria. And that was like a slap in the face to the rabbis and to the people of Israel. And he went there to meet with this woman and, and to encounter that bridge between the Jews and the Gentiles. And uh, it was just such a great time of ministry. But he's talking to her. She ends up coming to Team Jesus, right? And then she does what? She runs into town and she evangelizes. She's probably one of the first uh, evangelical Christians. And she converts the town. She like brings a lot of people back to meet with Jesus. But the wisdom he gave me was not that encounter. It was what happened afterwards with the apostles. Because they walked back to Jesus and they said, are you hungry? We have food. Do you, you want to eat? And he goes, I'm I have food that you don't even know about. And he talks about in John 4, this is where the wisdom comes, verse 34 to 36. He says this, he goes, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now... The one who reaps, draws a wage, and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. He's talking about us coming together in heaven. He's talking about us seeking the lost, going to find the people that need to know about Jesus. See, that's our purpose. So we're not hoping, our hope isn't delayed like the woman in Samaria. She was waiting on the Messiah. We know the Messiah came. Now she knows that truth also. Our hope is the second coming. Our hope is when Jesus comes back to, to make it right, to take care of evil once and for all, and to call us home. That's where our hope is. So our hope delayed is that second coming. That's where our hope is. So I pray that we have the hope of that Sumerian woman that we're excited about the coming of the Messiah for the second time. So as you listen to this message, you know, drill deep into the message the Holy Spirit has for you. Uh, we invite you to open your hearts and your ears up to that. Uh, if you're here for the first time, we say thank you for being here. Uh, we are so grateful that you're with us. Uh, if you're new to friendship, we don't have an offering basket. We're not going to pass that around. There's a white box in the back of the room under the Pray for the Persecuted banner. Feel free to put your offering in there uh, for the kingdom. Uh, and while you're back there, we invite you to pray over the persecuted, but also the persecutors. And as you know, there's a lot of that going on nowadays. So make sure you lift that up when you go back there to put your offering in. Uh, say a quick prayer for them. Uh, now, if you are uh, uh, looking for a different way to, to give, you can do that online. You could text. You could stop in during the week. Those are all available for you as well. Uh, we're here generally Monday through Friday, like 9 to 2, 9 to 3, uh, but not this Monday because it's a holiday, so don't come in tomorrow. Uh, but uh, uh, if you are new, we invite you to fill out one of these postcards like you see on the screen. That gives us your name, email, phone number, some way we can reach out to you after today, uh, see how the message was. If you have any questions about the scripture, uh, we want to be able to answer that for you. Uh, and if you have a new cell phone or a new email address, you want us to update the system, this is a, a great way to do that. Um, so think about that as, before you leave today. Ladies Bingo, you have uh, an event coming up April 12th, a couple Fridays from now. 
Uh, so be prepared for that. It's a great way to meet and fellowship with your sisters in Christ. Uh, and you can also disciple people. You can invite them uh, to come to church. It's a great way to get them started and get them familiar with the building. Uh, and uh, uh, that's going to be at 630. And they ask you to bring a wrapped item, a spring kind of themed gift, as well as a snack to share. Uh, so think about that, ladies. Uh, and uh, this is a group that we're excited about kicking off. This is our young adult ministry kickoff. This is age 18 to 35. Uh, it's uh, second service, after second service. So in two weeks, uh, we're going to be launching this ministry. So if you fit that, that age category, then we invite you to come out and get to meet some of the young people at Friendship. Uh, and if you know people that fit that category, invite them, even if they're unchurched, this is a great way to get them connected to the body of Christ, uh, and then they get to find out a little bit more about Jesus, and then hopefully become part of uh, the body of Christ here in Dover. Uh, Women for Christ, your, your group is starting up again uh, April 5th at 6 p.m., and that's going to be right here. Uh, and if you didn't sign up for that, uh, we invite you to sign up at the Welcome Center so we can get a head count for that as well. Now, uh, we have a clothing drive going on, so we need your gently used clothes. Not the ones you're wearing right now, so just relax. Uh, but when you get home, you could put them in a bag and bring them out. After you wash them, bring them back to church and donate them. Uh, but you can do uh, your closet today or tomorrow and, and uh, tell your neighbors and your friends. So any jackets, clothing, shoes, anything uh, we can help the community uh, with, we're going to start collecting that. Uh, that's why the trailer's in the parking lot, and then uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about the clothing drive and the giveaway as it gets closer. But for now, gather up those clothes. Uh, the craft fair is upon us. It's next month. Uh, it's literally a month away, May 4th, and uh, we're going to be taking in some baked goods to sell. Uh, we're going to be having a, a table of baked goods, and also uh, we have booths available. I believe most of them are outside. Uh, but if you like crafting and selling stuff, all the proceeds are going to go to the mission trip uh, that we make off of uh, this craft fair. So uh, make sure you tell your friends to support it. Let them know we're having a craft fair so they can come out and shop. Uh, and then the last slide for today, I believe, is the, the church retreat. Uh, we want to make sure that we get a head count. This is just a, an estimate of how many people are going to be coming to the church retreat this year. Uh, we need at least 95 to get the the facility uh, to get the lodge so that we don't have to share it with another church. So right now, I think the count is 78. I didn't, ha I didn't have a chance to look at it after uh, the 9 o'clock service. But uh, if you feel this is something you want to do as a family, if you're feeling led to, to be a part of this, then make sure you sign up. Uh, give us a head count so we can include it in the numbers. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, the paying for it as we move along in the, the year. But we're going to be going out September 13th to the 15th. It's a time of fellowship, uh, friendship, uh, solitude. You'll be able to pray in nature. There's rocking chairs on this lodge. We have probably like 100 rocking chairs. I mean, it really is a blessing. If you haven't been to our, our facility uh, in Newville, it's called uh, uh, Colonel Denning State Park, uh, Camp Ulysua. Uh, but uh, come out and check it out. Be a part of the, the family. You'll be blessed for sure. And um, uh, any questions, just see one of the pastors, one of the staff, or one of the, the elders. Uh, they've all been there. Uh, but at this point, uh, we invite you to stand. We have a prayer and two more songs to give back to the Father. All right, go ahead and bow your heads this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we get to worship you this morning, God, and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, of your son that you sacrificed for our sins. God, as we go throughout this message today, we just ask that you open up our hearts to the words and be with Pastor Logan as you, he preaches the words that you've given him. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Go ahead and greet one another. Say hi to somebody you didn't come with this morning. Well, good morning once again. Children are remaining in the service. Hopefully you got an email from us uh, reminding you of that. But uh, if you don't get our emails, then you didn't get reminded. But now you know. <laughs> Children, it's time to uh, join us and listen up. That's not because it's Easter. It's because it's the fifth Sunday of the month. Uh, and we do that four times a year. So uh, if you do, uh, if you have younger kids that are nursery age, the nursery is open. But kids church is not happening this weekend. We will resume that next weekend. But we welcome you again, uh, once again here on Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate what our Savior did for us on that day nearly 2,000 years ago. And we proclaim his name today, the beautiful name, the wonderful name, and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our King. But why is his name powerful? It's not just the the saying of his name that has power. It's that when we talk about his name, it represents his character and his nature and what was shown on that Resurrection Sunday on the third day. When they opened the tomb and found that he was not there, they saw that he had defeated our final enemy, which is death. And so what we have already proclaimed today by song is true. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. Think about all those that were mocking Jesus as he was dying. But he silenced their boast. The heavens are roaring the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. It's not just a song that we like because it you know, makes us feel the fire of the Spirit. It's truth in those words what a great reminder of who it is that we worship and why we worship him if you are with us for the first time today if you haven't been to church in a long time or if you aren't even sure that you believe in this Jesus we're speaking of I pray that today is more than just an enjoyable Easter tradition for you I pray that you have an encounter today with the one who has no rival Now, those of us who are regulars here at Friendship know what it's like to know him and trust him. But that doesn't mean every day is easy. In fact, very few days are easy. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean circumstances are good. It means we know our God is bigger than the circumstances. So we endure and we keep battling. Speaking of battles, over the past several weeks, we've asked you who are part of Friendship Community Church to share with us the current battles you are facing. We did this by email, so again, if you're not on our email list or if you choose not to read them when we send them, then you might not know what we're talking about. But many of you did respond with the battles you are currently facing. And so we are trusting as we plan this through the Holy Spirit, we're trusting that the Holy Spirit will use what you have shared to show others here today that they are not alone that the battles they're facing are, are shared by you all. In fact, Paul says that, right? Always keep on praying for all of the saints because you know that your brothers around the world are going through the same things. It's a, it, there's value in us saying, here's where I'm struggling, here's where I'm at. I know you're there too, so let's battle together. As they see the battles you're facing and they know they are not alone, we trust that they too will see that they can keep fighting and trusting in the God who raises the dead. So as Steph and the team get ready to sing this special song that we picked a few weeks ago, the lyrics of this song will not be on the screen. I know you're used to singing along, you're used to joining in, but this is a song you're just going to have to listen to. Or if you know it, then you can sing along. It is rather popular in the Christian music scene right now. But what will be on the screen is those very battles 
that were shared with us. Your names will not be attached to them, so no one will know whose is whose, because that's not what matters. What matters is that you see that brothers and sisters from right here in this church are battling these things. Some of them are sins. Some of them are illnesses and health-related things. Some of them are mental uh, things. Some of them are dealing with other people. All things that we deal with. But listen to the promise of this song as you see the battles that your brothers and sisters are facing. And we'll, you'll probably see them a couple times. We'll kind of scroll through as the song continues. And as you see them, consider the ones you are facing. The song we're going to sing is called, or they're going to sing is called, you're, You've Already Won. Those of you men who were with us at the Ignite Men's Conference a few weeks ago, you got to hear this there live by the group that sings it, Shane and Shane. So you'll be familiar with it. And then we'll have a surprise at the end for those of you that love hymns. <clears throat> but it's, if you know it, you can sing along because when you trust Jesus, every battle that you face is a battle he's already won. We just need to continue to trust him and walk through it. Let's listen as they sing.
seated and let's pray God we just thank you for reminding us that you've already won the battle and because you won the greatest battle because you live that we can keep battling we can face tomorrow Lord we're going to turn to your word now and we pray Lord that you would speak it and speak your message to each person here based on what they need to hear. I believe, Lord, every single person is here because you've drawn them here this morning, not by any accident, but because you've drawn them. Your spirit has brought them here. So speak to us now through your word. Speak through me, Lord, and remove anything up here that's not of you that doesn't, that doesn't need to be said. But speak to us and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, it's not just about what Jesus did on Resurrection Day. It's about what it means for us. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I can keep fighting the battle. And according to Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, I already have all I need to fight the battle. We're going to start there. We'll get into Romans later. We're going to talk about the resurrection story a little bit too. But I wanted to start here. Because you need to understand that you have what you need to fight whatever battle you're facing. Paul says this as he's talking about praying for the believers and what he hopes that they will understand. He picks it up. He says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power, the power for us who believe, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. If you believe in and follow Christ as Savior and Lord, then you have the same power. Everybody say same power. Same power. All right, you're all awake now. Same power, <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit to fight your battles that was used to raise him up from the dead, which is what we're here celebrating today. You have that same power available to you. The thing is that even when you walk in that power, the question that you often wonder is, how much longer, Lord? Whatever you're battling, especially if it's overwhelming, you might be saying that every day. How much longer, Lord? Let me ask you, has God ever answered that question for you when you've asked it? Would it make a difference if he did? Today's Resurrection Sunday sermon title, as Ben mentioned, is Hope Delayed because the death and resurrection of Jesus teaches us that even when the battle seems lost, it's not over, it's merely hope delayed. And God doesn't answer the question of how much longer it'll be delayed because if the answer is unfavorable to us, we might give up hope. Now, maybe you're someone who has a lot of endurance, a lot of perseverance, and so maybe you think you'll stick it out. If God just tells you how much longer, then you'll stick it out. But I know that I won't. If God said, you're going to battle this for 20 more years, Logan, there's a good chance I might say, I'm out, no thank you. 
And I know that because when I go to the gym and I do cardio, and I, I always set it for a specific amount of time so that when I start dying, I don't have to think that it's going to go on forever. I can look at the time and go, okay, I only have to deal with this for a little bit longer. But that's never more than about 30 minutes, right? Now, my wife, on the other hand, who was just up here singing a moment ago, she loves to run long distances. I'm talking about 5Ks, 10Ks, 15Ks, probably even 401Ks, if there was a thing. A race that you could run that was a 401K, she'd probably sign up for that. It does not bother her to be three hours away from the end of the marathon. But I did not get that gene. I just don't have the patience. So God will likely never tell me how long because he knows that I might decide it's just not worth it. But the Christian life for all of us is about knowing the ultimate future without worrying about it. It's about knowing who our hope is in and knowing what will happen in the end, but not worrying about when it will become a reality. It's about knowing that we're going to be with Jesus. Uh, did you hear the bridge in the song? I know how this story ends. We will be with you again. <laughs> no more fear in life or death. Because you're my Savior, my defense, right? So it's about knowing what the reality is, the ultimate reality, but not sitting around going, when's it going to be, Lord? It's about knowing it and living in it and trusting in it and not worrying about when. See, there's a reason why in the Old Testament God gave them manna to eat daily. He did not give them what they would need for the rest of their time in the wilderness. Obviously, it could spoil, but he could have figured out a way around that. The thing is, is he knew that if they had any idea how long the journey would take them, they might lose hope. There's a reason why Jesus in the New Testament teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, right? But how often are we going, Lord, show me the plan for five years from now? <laughs> We're not praying like he told us to pray. But he tells us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And then he says a different time, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worry on its own. we got to stop worrying about how many more dailies we're going to have. We don't know. Imagine his disciples praying this way on Good Friday after they watched him breathe his last on the cross. Imagine the mental and emotional battles they had to endure on Holy Saturday. And let's not assume that they put their feet up, relaxed, and said, he's got this, can't wait to see that empty grave tomorrow. That is not the reality of who they were. Scripture is clear that they didn't really believe it until well after he was resurrected. They doubted and they rejected the notion at first. In fact, when the women came and told them, I have seen the Lord, they said, this is nonsense. But on that Saturday, that full day in between when he had been crucified and when he was resurrected, they had to be wondering, have we wasted our time following him? How many years have we wasted? Was he a total fraud? And the all-important, what's going to happen to me now? What will the rest of my life look like? How much life do I even have left? Because we believed in what was a fraud. Now, all of that changed when hope was realized the next morning as three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome, came to the tomb of Jesus expecting to anoint his body but instead found the greatest surprise of all time. So we're going to read the resurrection story in the Gospel of Mark. Mark 16, verses 2 to 7. If you want to turn there, feel free. Otherwise, it's on the screen. Romans 8 will still be the continuing in the sermon series. We'll get to that later. But on Easter Sunday, I felt we needed to read a story of the resurrection here. And I'll reference a couple other ones, but we're going to look mainly here at Mark's account of this right now. In verse 1, it just simply named the three women who came to the tomb. And so we're picking it up in verse 2. Very early on the first day of the week. That's why we celebrate it on Sunday, by the way. Do you ever, I don't know if you, how many of you knew that, so I'll just mention that real quick. Right, the, the Sabbath at the end of the week for Jews is Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. So the very next day is the first day of the week, Sunday. We, our first day of the week is Monday, but their first day of the week is Sunday. So that's how we know Easter happened uh, the resurrection happened on a Sunday. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? There's a couple reasons why they asked that. 
First of all, it was really heavy. Three women could not have rolled the stone away themselves. Three men might not have even been able to do it, depending on how you know, manly they were, I guess. But, but it, would have been, it, would have been a take, it would have been a process to roll this stone away. Also, there was a, Matthew's gospel tells us, there was a guard of soldiers. And a guard, there is not a singular individual. A guard is a platoon of what I have read is there's at least four soldiers there around the clock. So they're taking turns, you know, relieving one another, four soldiers at a time at the tomb. So even if someone wanted to remove it, there's no way they could have done it. And that's why Matthew also tells us that an angel rolled back the stone. The stone. So let's continue here in Mark. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, was ve- which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Hope was no longer delayed. This, by the way, is the foundation of the Christian faith. Some people think it's the cross, but it's not the cross. Jesus was one of hundreds, if not thousands, of people over the years who suffered the torturous death of crucifixion, but he was the only one who didn't stay in the grave. Without the empty tomb, the cross is just a monument to the most unjust and brutal tragedy of all time. But the empty tomb proves that he was who he said he was. It proves that those who believe, like we do, do not have misplaced hope. And you see, that's, that's why the stone was rolled away. I want you to think about this. this. I just said this is the defining moment of our faith. This is the defining moment of our Christian faith. And guess who wasn't even there? Christ. <laughs> defining moment of our Christian faith and Christ wasn't even there. He was long gone. It wasn't like they just watched him walk out and had a big you know, moment, a big celebration. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Yeah. It wasn't like with Lazarus where they watched Lazarus walk out of the tomb. No. This was, he was gone. He was already long gone. The stone wasn't moved to let him out. The stone was moved to let us in. Why do you think the angel says, see the place where they laid him? See for yourself and believe. This is not a mystery. See it. You know where they laid him. You watched it happen. (laughs) See now that he was there and he ain't there no more. And believe. That was the whole reason why it was rolled away. to, To show them that they don't have misplaced hope. See, it might have been cool. It might have been a cool story if they walked in and Jesus was just standing there, like, you know, doing a crossword or something. What's up, my sisters? I was just waiting for you. But no, the angel says, he's not here. Come on. He's he's already moving on to something else. The Luke account says the the women were frightened by the angel's appearance. And then in uh, Luke 24, 5 and 6, they were asked this question, why do you look for the living among the dead he is not here he has risen amen now apply that question to your own life why do you look for the living among the dead what are you what are you hoping for that's clearly already been dead for a long time and you're just not one to believe it so you keep going back to more dead stuff more dead hope hope that is misplaced Why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember, their hope was based on Jesus being the true Messiah. And Jesus had said, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be killed and be raised to life on the third day. He had told them this. They should have believed it. But these ladies and the disciples, they had a hard time with it. Certainly we would have too. They were in this, because of what had happened, they were in this mindset of hope is gone, hope is lost. They had to get back out of that mindset. And they had to believe that hope was right on schedule. They are no longer searching for what's dead, but they are searching for the one who is very much alive. And if our God is not dead, 
as we like to proclaim. If our God is not dead, if our Lord and Savior is alive, then hope is also alive. And while we don't know how long we will have to endure by faith and with hope, we do know who and what will be waiting for us. If we believe in the resurrection of Jesus, which I assume you do, that's why you've come to church on Easter Sunday. If we believe in the resurrection of Jesus and we believe his words that he will come back and take us to be with him, right? If you don't know where that's at, it's in John 14, right at the beginning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I am where I am going. I am I'm going. My father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you so that I can come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. That's what he tells them. That's his promise to them. So to believe in his resurrection, you then pretty much have to also believe that he's right on schedule. So at some point, he's coming back. And he's going to take us to be with him. And so if we believe all of those things, if they all line up, then we must also approach any suffering that we face today with the same hope that he encouraged them to have even before the cross. And he encourages it again to a specific church in Smyrna, but really the whole church, all believers, in Revelation chapter 2, 8 to 11. So we're going to look at those, and then we'll move on to Romans 8. Revelation 2, 8 to 11. This is, again, one of the letters to the churches, but the, if you have a Bible that shows the letters in red, then this, these words are in red, because it's Jesus speaking. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. We can skip over that, but isn't it important that they get that reminder? Like, I'm about to tell you some hard stuff, so maybe you should remember what I've already done. That's what that song sang, right? I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done, so I know I can trust you. So here's a reminder. This is the one that's the one speaking to you already defeated death. He died and came to life again. And he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. Jesus knows your battles. Stop trying to hide them. Many of you were brave. You bravely shared them to be put on the screen. Some I know probably didn't because maybe they caved into fear. I had one person this week tell me that they were go- had gone back and forth on it and they said, I, I don't know if I want people to know. <laughs> and they said, oh, I know it'll be anonymous, but, but you'll know. I'm like, it's not going to change any. I mean, I know that the people of this church are facing battles. And I, you know, I don't always know what they are, but I know a lot of, a lot of what's going on, I guess. But also, you know, if, if I know, okay, there are so many people here that need to know, that need to see, that need to see those battles on the screen and go, yes, I'm, I'm dealing with that too. I thought I was the only one. But Jesus already knows. Jesus knows exactly what you're dealing with. There's no benefit to hiding them. And I praise God that that person didn't hide them. And I praise God that so many of you did not hide your battles. You said, yeah, let's put it out there. Let's just be honest about what we're dealing with. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. See, we're so used to praying, God, save me. God, protect me. God, take this pain away. God, get me out of this. And we assume that's what he wants. And yet here's Jesus going, you know what? This might even kill you. This might even kill you. Don't assume that I don't want you to die. (laughs) from it because I want you to be an example whether it's in life or death I want you to be an example I want you to be faithful he says even if you die you're going to get something better you're going to get life as your victor's crown it's almost a repeat of what he says to his disciples right that whoever wants to save their life will lose it anyway and whoever wants to whoever's willing to lose their life for my sake and for the gospel will gain it If you are faithful to the point of death, I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church is. That's how we know this is not just for the people of Smyrna. This is for all churches everywhere. 
Let the, hear, let, let the Spirit speak to you what he's saying to the church at Smyrna. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. And whatever battles you are facing, whatever circumstances are causing suffering, don't be afraid and don't lose hope, even if it kills you. And some of you I know are battling illnesses that could take your life. It could happen. And all of us are probably going to battle those at some point. Hate to break it to you, but none of us are getting out of this thing alive. It's, uh, there's going to be an end for all of us. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can say you can wait for, you know, God to you know, send you the, take you up in a chariot of fire, or you can wait for the rapture, and maybe we'll be blessed that that happens, but we should assume the Bible says death is the destiny of everyone, and the living should take this to heart, so we should assume that we're not getting out of this alive and that something is going to cause our death. And we should continue to be faithful in that because we understand that even earthly death isn't the end. Jesus is the one who tasted death yet came to life again so we can trust when he says he will give life to those who are faithful and we must trust this even though the fulfillment of that hope is delayed. Now it's interesting that the way Jesus describes remaining faithful in this letter twice has to do with victory. We get a victor's crown, which is like a trophy, and it says we are, we are labeled by him as victorious, the one who is victorious. Even if we die, we are labeled as victorious. Victory in the eyes of the Lord doesn't look like victory in the eyes of the world, right? The world would laugh. The world laughed at Jesus, mocked him. Oh, look at him. We got him. He's dead. It's over. The world, will, the world has mocked and, and laughed at Christians for years as they've been persecuted and, and martyred. But Jesus says that's victory. It might not look like it, but you're winning the battle. <laughs> that's victory. The loss is when you, in an effort to save your life, give up your soul and say, okay, I, I, I'm, I don't follow him, right? That's actually loss. But with that, we're going to jump back into our ongoing sermon series, which started at the beginning of 2024 here at Friendship, and it's called Romans Road. As we journey through the book of Romans, today we turn to the second half of chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there with us. If not, there, there will be words on the screen, or if you want to read along for yourself, uh, there's Bibles at the back. You feel free to pick, get up and go pick one up. But as we finish last week's section, the first half of Romans 8, we saw where Paul is very clear that we are the adopted children of God, which makes us co-heirs with Christ, which means we will share in his sufferings so that we can also share in his glory. But as followers of the one who suffered, we will also suffer. We may suffer persecution, or we may just suffer from constantly fighting our battles, right? You, you, you ever win a battle that you felt like you lost? <laughs> I mean, it happens all the time. You're going, man, I, I, I didn't lose it. I, I didn't give in, but I feel like I, I got beat. I don't know if I want to keep doing this. I really feel beaten up. Either way, one way or another, suffering in this world is a guarantee. So Paul then follows that verse up with this reason for hope. No matter what, verse 18 in Romans 8, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now just think about what he's saying here. Paul is a guy who experienced more suffering than any of us. And if you don't know about it, you can go read 2 Corinthians 11 on your own. We took a look at that about a month ago or so here. We're not going to have time to do it right now, but 2 Corinthians 11, he kind of lists all the things he's had to go through. But even with all of that, how does he compare his suffering to his hope for glory? He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't compare it at all. It's not like he does a comparative analysis and glory comes out on top by a nose. No, he says they are not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Notice that it will not only be revealed to us, but Paul says it will be revealed in us. In other words, God has already put this glory into every believer, but if something needs to be revealed, then that means it is currently hidden. So he's put the glory into every believer. We believe that and we act accordingly by faith, but one day it will be obvious for all to see. Theologian Leon Morris said the glory will be revealed, not created. The implication is that it is already existent, but not apparent. 
it's going to be obvious. Paul says this another way in another letter to the Christians in Corinth. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18, then we'll come back to Romans, so leave your finger there if you have your Bible open. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18, Therefore we do not lose heart. If you were to go back and read earlier in 2 Corinthians 4, it's kind of a, a well-known passage uh, where he says, you know, we are, uh, we are uh, pressed but not destroyed. We are persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed, I should say. I always get it all mixed up. But he says all this, and, and, and essentially the whole point is to say, yeah, we're, we're really suffering here. We are going through it, but we are not defeated. It's not over. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, Boy, we know this is true. Can't believe there wasn't an amen on that one. Some of you have gotten hurt sneezing before. Or trying to tie your shoes. Or just rolling over in bed. Before the first service, I was standing back there. And just, just standing there, just worshiping, standing. And I don't, you know, I, I have a little bit of messed up back, so I can't really stand straight up, so I always go back and forth like this. And all of a sudden, I went like that, and I got this, like, sharp pain in my ankle. I was like, what the heck? I know I've been standing a lot over the last four days, but I have no idea where that came from. We are wasting away, yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul did not experience light and momentary troubles. Let's remember that, right? We're talking about a guy who was beaten, flogged, imprisoned, shipwrecked, falsely accused, stoned and left for dead, and much more. Yet once again, there is no real comparison, he says. He said, Paul says that if you were to take a scale, right, and on one side list all the troubles that believers face or will ever face, and by the way, in, in the 20th and 21st century, there's been more Christians martyred for their faith than all the other centuries combined. That's why we have a whole map back there with a bunch of blacked out countries. You might be surprised because we're so used to it being so easy and comfortable here, but there are probably more countries in the world where it's not safe to be a Christian than there are that, that it is safe to be a Christian. So we have to remember that, that there, this is still, suffering is still a very real thing in this world and particularly for people for their faith but he says if we were to take all of that and put it on the scale on one side and then somehow quantify the glory those troubles are achieving for us and put that on the other side it would be far weightier far outweigh the troubles I was with my children at Castler Park last Friday my children for those that don't know are five and three they're still little ones they wanted me to get on the seesaw with them. But what do you think happened when I got on the opposite side from them? <laughs> Since I far outweigh even their combined weight, they went up in the air and I went straight to the ground, nearly injuring my knee in the process. Another reminder that I am outwardly wasting away. But the closer we get to the realization of our hope, and by the way, we are closer every day. It might still be thousands of years from now, but we are closer every day. You are closer today than you were yesterday. Each day is a step closer to the realization of our hope. And the closer we get to that, the more our troubles are moving out of the picture and the more his glory is moving in. That should be a comfort for those of you that have lost loved ones recently. Okay. Or those of you that... Or those of you that are facing a, a, an illness that, that may be terminal, this should be a comfort to you. Joyce Cronister, one of our sisters, was with us in the 9 o'clock service, and, and I, you know, it, it wasn't, not in my notes, it wasn't planned, but I saw her sitting there, and I said, we just gotta, I just got to talk about Joyce real quick. Joyce came to me last Sunday, and she, I said, how you doing? And she had lost her mother uh, about two weeks ago, and I said, how you doing? And she said, I, I'm doing great. I, I, I don't, I don't really, I'm not really shedding any tears. <laughs> I said, why? I didn't say why. I said, I understand. She goes, it, it feels weird. I was like, it shouldn't be weird. It shouldn't be weird. I said, You're, you know you know where she was going. You, you know that she had faith. You know that she trusted in our Savior. You know that she's on her way to glory. You know that the glory is far, far weightier than the sufferings. 
And the Bible also says, Paul also says that we do not grieve like the way the rest of the world grieves who have no hope. So I said, Joyce, what you're experiencing is exactly what the Bible says. It doesn't mean you're not going to miss her. You're going to miss her. You're going to have those hard times. But you understand it from, a, from, from an eternal perspective. Amen. This should be a comfort to us. It should be a comfort to us if you are struggling with those things. The glory is on its way in. The suffering is moving out of the picture. We just have to keep trusting in his plan. We have to keep our hope alive. Paul addresses that in Romans 8, 22 to 25 as we go back to our main scripture. Romans 8, verse 22, and this whole, this section here is where this title, Hope Delayed, came from. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, we already have received, we are already adopted children, but the culmination of that will be when our bodies are redeemed, and we're waiting for that glory. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. How are you at being patient? As I already told you, I run short on patience in a lot of situations, but that doesn't mean I don't have it. See, I, would, I, I could lie to myself. I could make it easy on myself and say, well, obviously, you know, God just didn't make me very patient. Woe is me. I just, you know, I just, I'm just terrible at this, so I might as well just accept that I'm not a very patient person. I could do that, but that'd be a lie. It'd be no different than lying, saying I, I can't beat this sin. I can't be, I, I, you know, that's another lie. You, those are lies because here's how I know it's a lie. Because patience is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit clearly listed in Galatians 5. And as we read last week, earlier in Romans 8, Paul says anybody who's in Christ has the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not a Christian. Right? So if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't say, well, the Holy Spirit decided to only give me like 30% of the fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> That's not what he does. You can't say that. So if I know the Spirit is in me, then that means I do have the ability to be patient. What's the problem? I just have to surrender the impatient flesh. You have the ability to overcome your sin. You just have to surrender the flesh and what the flesh desires. I have to surrender the impatient flesh. That's probably true for you too. But he tells us to wait patiently. The Greek word for wait patiently here is hypomone, and it means patient endurance, steadfastness, or perseverance. It combines two Greek words, meaning to remain and under. And I thought that was interesting because God, think about it, God gives us the ability to wait patiently because we remain under his will. And if we remain under his will, then that means we remain under whatever troubles he allows us to experience. We say, okay, this is part of your will. Rather than complaining about them and giving up, we say, okay, God, I remain under your will and command, so may your will be done. We have some examples of this in Scripture, do we not? We read about Jesus having this perspective, the patient endurance during his prayer and extreme anxiety, sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you say, he was God. Why was he so anxious? Well, you forget that Jesus was fully human. So he had to deal with the flesh. He had to deal with what the flesh wants. And he surrendered it 100% of the time. Surrendered the flesh to God's will. Not my will, but your will, Father. He, he showed us what this was like. Being fully human, he had to experience and go through and learn what it means to surrender the flesh. And I want to ask this question to you today. Could he maybe have been taught this by his parents? I say that because we got, we got children with us today. And, and, and you parents, I want you to think about how important it is to teach and model patience and hope for your children. We're very good at modeling impatience and complaining and things like that, but model patience for your children. Here's why I suggest that he could have learned this from his parents. 
The teenage virgin Mary, when told in Luke chapter 1, which we read at Christmas time, we're not going to go there right now, but when she was told that she would become pregnant, and certainly knowing all the trouble that that might bring her, she could have asked Gabriel tons of questions. She asked one and only one question. Um, Mr. Gabriel, I know how babies are created, and since that's not a part of my life right now, how is this exactly going to work? Gabriel gave her the answer. Well, of course, the Holy Spirit's going to, you know, come on you and then you guys are that's how it's going to happen and and she's going well that doesn't even make as much sense as telling me i'm going to be pregnant that makes even less sense than the original thing you said but mary rather than complain rather than go but 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 i don't get it it doesn't make sense woe is me she says and i'm just paraphrasing here sort of for our language of today all right i don't get it at all but i am the lord's servant so may it be as you, his messenger, has said. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, I remain under your will, Father. I'm not under my own. I remain under your will. So your will be done, even if it's going to lead to the worst suffering of all time. And Mary, in a moment of certainly extreme anxiety too, said, I... I don't get any of this. I don't make, it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to remain under your will. May it be as you have said. I'm going to wait patiently and endure until all of this gets sorted out. I'm going to trust you. That's what I'm going to stake my life on. What is it that allowed the human Jesus to trust in the Father's plan even as crucifixion awaited him? What is it that allowed the teenage virgin who was pledged to her future husband and would instantly be accused of adultery and shunned by almost everyone she knows trust in the Father's plan? Well, continuing in Romans 8, we come to a verse that has the answer to those questions. A verse some of you probably know by heart. And I want to show you the following verses as well. Romans 8, 28 to 30. Paul writes, And we know that in all things... Whatever you're going through, whatever Jesus went through, whatever Mary went through, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Paul is declaring that even our sufferings are part of God's good process. The battles that you are facing are part of God's good process. He may not have created the battle. He doesn't create the sin. He doesn't create the situation. But as you suffer, he's watching and allows you to go through it. It's part of his good process. It's for our good. It's for his good. It's for the good of all who will love him and are called by him. And with that, I want to take a couple minutes to identify a situation that hits close to home for many in this area. If you are on Facebook, you have probably at some point seen a little bit of the story of a young boy named Dakota Dixon. Dakota, I I don't know the family at all. I don't know his mom. But Dakota, about a year ago or so, started having some health problems. And within a few months after that, it was determined he had a brain tumor. And what I know of the story, now some of you may be able to correct me even more on, but what I know of it is simply that for about the last six months he's been in the hospital being kept alive by machines and tubes and so forth. And yet, every day his mother posts an update and every day almost one of the first things she does is gives glory to God. Praising him for another night. (laughs) Praising him for the good things. Yes, she's honest when, hey, it wasn't a great night, or hey, we're, we're critical here, it's life and death. And those of us that are reading it from afar and, and, and praying for this family are probably, you know, each day wondering when's, when's it going to be the end? How much longer are they going to have to deal with this? We're all praying and hoping that one day he's just going to walk right out of that hospital, completely healed, a total miracle. But we also know that God's story isn't just about earthly life and death, right? So even if he doesn't walk out of that hospital, even if he dies, he's on his way to glory. She has already said, I've given him over to the Lord. God, she keeps saying this in every post, God wins no matter what. 
So I had a chance to reach out to her just through a Facebook comment. That's all it was. I don't, again, I don't know the woman. But after last week's message, we read Romans chapter 8. I, all I could think about after the sermon, sometimes God does this, right? You preach a sermon, you don't even know what you're going to be thinking about afterwards. But all I could think about was that situation. And so I sent a comment. I, I, I shared the verses from Romans 8, 16 and 17 to say, look, you are an adopted child. Your son is an adopted child of God. And that means that even if we share in his sufferings, it is so that we can share in his glory. And what I said there was, I have no idea how much longer God is going to, to make you go through this and endure it. But I know that every single second of it will not be wasted. It's all part of his good plan. He's using it for his good. I said, you guys are an example of faith to all who are watching and praying. In these verses, Paul is declaring that even child cancer, all things are good. And in this great piece of scripture, Paul ties together his urging to patiently persevere in sufferings while we eagerly wait for what we hope for, which is the complete resurrection of our bodies away from this earthly mess. He ties that together with the power and sovereignty of God and he says, this is what gives us reason to hope and pers persevere even when we deal with the most horrible things like child cancer. Paul basically says that God's plan of salvation included all of these steps from knowing us before we were created to predestining us to become brother or sister of Jesus to calling us to walk out the challenges and blessings he puts before us to justifying us by faith in Jesus and to finally glorifying us. Now, I have to address one thing here. Some people have a problem with the word predestination. But contrary to popular belief, it is not the opposite of free will. God uses both. Pastor Chuck Smith, founded the Calvary Chapel movement, said this, of course I believe in predestination since it's plainly taught in the scriptures. The doctrine could be assumed even if the word was never explicitly used. It's a thrilling truth that doesn't upset me at all. The fact that he chose me and began a good work in me proves that he'll continue to perform it. He wouldn't bring me this far and then dump me. And that is the truth I want to hang on with that quote. The rest of it about predestination, I hate talking about that stuff. But you have to understand that because God knew you before you were born because he planned for you, because he knew what your life was going to look like, that he's been working all of this for the good. And he's not going to, the reason you can keep battling every day, beyond just trusting in the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, you can keep trusting and keep battling, because there's no way he would do all of that just to say, oh well, you're done now, and dump you. Because you see, all believers live between steps 4 and 5 in Romans 8.30, the verses we just looked at a few moments ago. All believers live between steps 4 and 5. We've, the first four have already happened. We've been foreknown by God. We've been predestined to become like Jesus. And that is a process, by the way, that, that, that God does with our cooperation and not to us. That's where free will comes into play. We surrender to his process. We surrender to the flesh, or we surrender the flesh to him. So we've been foreknown, we've been predestined, we've been called, and we've been justified by faith. If you're not a believer in Jesus, if you've not surrendered to him, then you're between steps three and four. You're not yet justified. You're, trying to, you're, you're still in your sins. You're trying to be justified by being a good person, and that's not possible, and you need, you need to come to know Jesus before it's too late. You can always talk to us about that if that's something you're thinking about. We'd love to walk you through that. But most of us here are believers, and so we have to understand that we are all between that fourth step and that fifth step. The only part of, of his process that is left is for God to glorify us in the end. And we're on the process of sanctification right now. The only one that hasn't happened at all yet is the glorification and our hope for that is based on what we know God has already done in raising Jesus from the dead. Even when it seemed like evil had won and defeated the Messiah, God was still in control. Jesus' life, remember this, was never taken from him. It was given up exactly when he decided it would be. 
But as his followers were losing hope, God proved that the story wasn't finished. He proved that he was working all things for the good, that those who wait patiently and endure will receive the glory. So Paul continues in the rest of Romans 8. Let's look at verses 31 to 34. This is what it means for all who put their faith in Christ and accept that hope unrealized is simply hope delayed. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? Everything that we just learned in in chapter 8, how important it is, what shall we say? What should we take away from this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Your who might be a what. What can be against us? If it's a battle, right? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, his son, graciously give us all things? And what, that, what does that mean? If he already gave you the greatest possible gift of his son, why would you think that there's going to be something else he's not going to give you that you need? Paul says this is obvious. It's just, it's, it's just kind of obvious here, right? If he gave up his son, then he will give you anything else you need to fight the battle, to endure, to persevere. Then he switches to condemnation. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Nobody can condemn you with Christ standing right next to God and going, he's my child, he's with me, he's my brother, he's he's taken care of. So as you continue to fight your battles, as you wait patiently for God to end your suffering and bring you to glory, understand this, there is no condemnation. It's really a repeat of what he says at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. People can try to condemn you. The devil can try to shame you. Your battles can try to overwhelm you, but they cannot succeed. The God who already gave up his son for us is not going to leave us hanging. He's not going to bring us this far just to dump us. He will give us whatever we need, and the one who died to give us peace with God and free justification by faith, he intercedes on our behalf as we persevere. Just think about what that means. Give, get that picture in your head of Jesus talking about you to the Father and going, yeah, I, I, know, what he's, I know he's struggling. I know he's fighting. I think today maybe he just needs a little bit more patience you know that that logan he he's already messed it up five times he needs another opportunity to be patient (laughs) he needs he needs he needs some conviction a reminder so he can say sorry and you know do it differently he's we're not going to condemn him because he's he's with us we're just going to figure out what else he needs the implications for what god has given us and the position that we have under his care and will, if we remain in Christ and seek to live by the Spirit, those implications cannot be understated. We have nothing to fear and no reason to quit. Some of you I know are walking in fear. Some of you have told me, I just, I just, I'm just so afraid. We have no reason to fear. Look how Paul wraps up the argument at the end of Romans 8 with such an encouraging reminder. And This will be our wrap up as well. Verses 37 to 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an amazing scripture that guarantees and secures our victory in Jesus. There are many things that will try to separate you from the love of God in Christ. Many things that will try to remove from you the hope you have in Him, but they are unable to do it. And that's because you are more than a conqueror. I never really understood what that meant, more than a conqueror. But as I thought about it this week, it kind of came to me. A conqueror, who is a conqueror? A conqueror simply destroys. They go around kicking butt, taking names, They destroy for their own power, their own gain, political or territorial or whatever. But you are more than that because you have a greater power than they do, a power in Jesus. You have a greater motive. It's not for personal gain. 
It's for the glory of Christ. You have a greater victory because you're fighting a battle that's already been won. You're not coming in going, I don't know if I can do this. You're fighting a battle that's already been won. And you have a greater love. Because by love, sometimes we even convert some of our enemies who persecute the faith. The victory in every way, if you are in Christ, is yours. Steph's going to come for the closing song. Our hope may be delayed, but it is very much alive. Our hope is found in the one who rose from the grave. Remember that nothing can separate you from the hope or from God's love in Christ. Said another way, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck you from his hand. Let's stand and sing in Christ alone. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for this message today. We're so grateful that you rose Jesus from the dead, that you emptied that tomb. And Jesus, we're so grateful that you sacrificed your body, that you gave your blood, that you took our sins with you. And Holy Spirit, we just ask now that you convict us, that you remind us 
that if we're still battling something, that we surrender it to you before we leave here. We give it to you in your house. So the battles we take on are your battles now. We fight that evil. We fight that non-belief in you that we witness to people as we go throughout this, this day today and celebrate your resurrection. And we lift all this up in your precious name, Jesus, our Lord and Savior and King of Kings. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, brothers.